Good morning, everyone. Sorry to interrupt conversations, but uh, want to be sure we stay on schedule. Hey, Jim. Good morning. Welcome to CSIS. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at uh, CSIS. And uh, I'm delighted to see such a big group in the room on a cold day and appreciate your, your coming out. Also want to say a word of welcome to our online viewers. We always have uh, lots of loyal viewers around the world. Um, and I'm told I should say that those of you on Twitter can follow us at CSIS using the hashtag CSIS Live. I have no idea what that means, but um, I'm sure it's important. Um, I also want to thank our generous sponsors, uh, JICA, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, and the Gates Foundation for making this event possible. Uh, the inspiration for this event uh, came from a conversation that I had uh, with uh, Mr. Nakazawa, the JICA representative here in Washington, during the grand opening of this building in October last year. Um, Nakazawa-san told me that uh, this year, 2014, is the 60th anniversary of Japan's uh, being a, an aid donor, uh, which actually surprised me because I happen to know from personal experience uh, that Japan, uh, well, first of all, in 1954, when Japan joined the Colombo Plan, uh, Japan was still recovering from the trauma of World War II. And so the fact that it started giving uh, aid already was, was significant. And I also knew from personal experience that for another dozen years, Japan was still borrowing money uh, from the World Bank uh, because in 1966, the World Bank made its final loan to Japan. And my father was uh, the Japan desk officer at the World Bank in charge of that loan. He was very skeptical about the loan uh, because Japan, two years earlier, had already joined the OECD, had hosted the Olympics, and had uh, launched the Shinkansen bullet train. And so it didn't seem that uh, Japan, a country like Japan, really needed concessional financing from the World Bank. But nevertheless, uh, he uh, pushed the loan forward. And, uh, and I'm delighted that my father, who's 97 years old uh, and still with us here uh, today, uh, uh, could join us. And his charming escort in red there is my wife, Patty. So <laughs> delighted that she could join, join us as well. Um, so over the past six decades, Japan has been a major force in the uh, international development assistance uh, scene. Uh, for a time, it was the leading uh, contributor of ODA, and it's still fourth or fifth, I think, in the world. But obviously, over that six decades, uh, the world has changed, uh, the development field has changed, uh, and of course, Japan's approach to ODA uh, has changed, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, we've assembled a, a really interesting and I'd say eclectic group of experts uh, from uh, Japan and the United States, uh, both uh, official uh, uh, representatives and NGOs. We also have a recipient country represented of Japan's ODA, uh, and uh, so we're going to look at, uh, all of these people are going to give a kind of 360 degree view of Japan's uh, experience and its collaboration with the United States in development assistance, and then look forward to the challenges ahead and where the areas for partnership may be uh, between the U.S. and Japan and with other uh, actors and uh, uh, players in the development space. So in just a minute, I will introduce our, our first opening speaker, uh, but first let me just run through some of the, uh, today's program and some of the housekeeping uh, issues. So after the opening keynote, uh, our first panel will assemble on stage and uh, we will uh, discuss lessons learned from six decades of development assistance. Uh, we will take a brief coffee break at 1045. Coffee, if you haven't already uh, discovered that, is on the terrace uh, behind us, behind you um, uh, out there. Um, and then we will reassemble promptly at 11 a.m. for the second panel, which is on key challenges ahead and opportunities for partnership. Uh, there will be a buffet lunch served on the terrace uh, at 1215. If you could bring your plates back in here and uh, eat uh, as long as you want, uh, but at about 1230 we will invite our uh, lunch and keynote speaker uh, to join us on stage and uh, then that will uh, take us to the end which will be roughly one o'clock. Uh, so that's the day's events. Uh, restrooms are out the glass doors to the right and back around to the right again um, and again there's coffee throughout the morning outside if you would like uh, to enjoy that. Uh, finally please turn off any uh, iPhones, cell phones, uh, 
Galaxy phones, whatever, and not branding uh, anything here, um, and, uh, and uh, any other noisemakers, appreciate that. So with that, let me introduce our, our first speaker. Um, Mark Fierstein is the Associate Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, U, uh, USAID or USAID, some people call it. Uh, he fulfills the duties of Deputy Administrator, and he is also the Assistant Administrator for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, he has a long career uh, at State, at AID, in the public uh, opinion research world as a journalist, um, and uh, so he brings a lot of experience from a number of perspectives uh, to AID's business, and I'm delighted to welcome Mark up to the, up to the podium. Thanks, Mark. Well, good morning. I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to open what I'm confident will be a most enlightening and interesting conversation on U.S.-Japan uh, development cooperation. And, you know, when I came in this morning, I was thinking what a difference uh, 12 hours uh, makes. Um, last night, if you're watching the Olympics, and my Japanese friends uh, just acknowledged that they were watching the uh, snowboard uh, competition, and they were, in fact, uh, rooting uh, for Sean White uh, to slip up. Um, <laughs> which is fine, uh, but I do want to congratulate uh, Japan for winning uh, two big medals yesterday, both the, uh, the uh, silver and the, uh, the bronze in the snowboard. So last night we were competitors, uh, tonight we talk about uh, cooperation. Of course, we have a big snowstorm uh, coming in, uh, so perhaps tomorrow we can all cross-country ski uh, to work, and I'll be happy to take you guys on uh, in that. So, um, you know, CSIS is really the perfect uh, venue uh, for such an event, and I've been attending CSIS, CSIS events now for 27 years, uh, since I first came to Washington back in 1987. Uh, it's made me a much better public servant uh, today as a result, and it's positioned me to speak here. I've been waiting 27 years for the opportunity to speak at CSIS, so I uh, finally, finally made it. It was worth the wait. And I always admired your old offices. I thought they were pretty nice over at 18 pretty special. And I was just told uh, by someone as I came in that the old offices weren't quite as nice if you looked uh, real close, uh, but these are, this is a really uh, terrific testament to, to all the work that you guys have done over the years. And of course, the center has established itself as a thought leader on a whole host uh, of issues, uh, including on development. And at USAID, we often turn to CSIS publications for guidance. Uh, we often reach out to the many experts uh, that you have here, and I think that we really perform better uh, as an agency, uh, thanks to, to all of you. I do want to thank a few people for helping to organize uh, this event, particularly uh, Matt and uh, Dan Rundy uh, and their teams, and we're very much uh, grateful for your efforts overall, but particularly in putting together uh, this event. Now, I understand that uh, JICA President uh, Tanaka will deliver remarks uh, at the conclusion of this event, and my boss, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah, uh, very much regrets that he, did you hear the beginning part? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell those jokes again, yeah. Um, and uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah, my boss, very much regrets that he could not be here uh, this morning, uh, but he and Dr. Tanaka will have a chance to meet later on today and, and talk about some of the subjects uh, that we take on uh, here this morning. Um, Dr. Tanaka has been a terrific leader uh, of JICA and a great partner uh, for USAID. And we very much appreciate his commitment uh, to the U.S.-Japan relationship, and we're excited to engage with him and all of his uh, colleagues on what will be the first, what is the first uh, U.S.-Japan uh, development dialogue, uh, which of course was launched by, by Vice President Biden uh, last year uh, when he went uh, to Japan. Now, my colleague Denise Rollins, who heads up our Asia Bureau, will participate on the second uh, panel today, and she'll be able to uh, expand a bit on, on some, uh, some of the points that I'll be hitting on. We'll also be hearing from uh, Janet Ballantyne, a uh, former USAID official. She has an advantage as being a former official. She's able to speak a bit more candidly than the rest of us, but we're, we're all pretty, pretty candid. We, we learn well from, from Janet. Um, <laughs> it's true, never stopped her before, yes. <laughs> um, but you know, each agency has recently celebrated a notable milestone. As we heard from Matt, uh, Japan is celebrating 60 years of providing development assistance. Uh, I think JICA itself is celebrating its 40th uh, anniversary. And two years ago, uh, USAID uh, turned 50. And as we recognized our 50th anniversary, uh, Caroline Kennedy uh, was on hand to commemorate what her father had launched uh, five decades before. 
and it's really most you know, poignant for us that she is now ambassador and playing such a central role in helping to advance the dialogue between JICA and USAID and helping to advance the relationship overall uh, between our two countries. Now, both of our agencies are, are proud of our histories and our accomplishments, uh, but we also continue to evolve as organizations. And, and just two weeks ago, USAID issued a new mission statement, and it focuses the agency on working to end extreme poverty and to promote resilient democratic societies. Um, and and the, the, the focus on extreme poverty is a notable one, and the development community is increasingly uh, focused on that particular challenge. Uh, you may recall that a year ago, uh, in the State of the Union address, President Obama called upon Americans uh, to come together and to work to help eradicate poverty by 2030, uh, help, help eradicate extreme poverty in the world uh, by 2030. And organizations like the World Bank, USAID, JICA are, are coming uh, together uh, to focus on that. It's a goal that seemed, frankly, out of reach, you know, 10, 15, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but given the progress that's been made uh, in recent years, it's now a goal that's in sight, and uh, we believe that we can replicate and accelerate the progress uh, that's been made uh, in recent years. Now, on the one hand, both USAID and JICA have significant resources to put toward the goal of ending extreme poverty. We rank number one and two among, among donors in the world in the amount of assistance that we provide. Uh, and together, we represent 40% of donor assistance in the world. So if you have a conference like this about US and Japan, uh, you really are talking very much about uh, a, a full spectrum of, of development cooperation around the world. But of course, the role of development assistance is changing, and it's not all about our budgets. Uh, today, private capital flows vastly exceed official development assistance, and it was very much the reverse. Uh, a couple decades ago. Uh, we all know that private philanthropic organizations are increasingly uh, playing a significant role as funders of development programs, in some cases even more uh, than what aid agencies are doing. And we can now take advantage of innovative technologies that are creating new possibilities in health, energy, uh, education, and a range of other sectors. So we are very much looking at a new model of development in which we leverage other actors and serve really more as a catalyst uh, for collective action. And both USAID and JICA recognize we need to work together to take advantage of these dynamics and maximize our development contributions. And, and throughout today, we'll be eager to hear from you and, your, and, and get your suggestions on how we can take advantage of these new dynamics, and particularly with this focus on extreme poverty. You know, how should our approach uh, change? Are there things we should be doing? Uh, differently other particular sectors that you think we might be more effective in than, than others. We're very much eager to get your, your thoughts on that. Now, one area in particular in which uh, both of our organizations are coming together uh, is with, with regard to the empowerment of women. And as you know, for decades, USAID has been leading global efforts to achieve gender equality. And last year, Japan committed to investing $3 billion to advance gender equality, both within Japan uh, and outside. And USAID and JICA recognize that if we can erase inequities and put women on equal footing with men, we can unlock human potential on a transformational scale. And we already are working uh, together to advance that goal. Last week, Carla Coppell, who's the chief strategy officer at USAID and also the former uh, gender advisor there, was in Tokyo uh, to represent USAID at a joint USAID uh, JICA training event for women entrepreneurs in Africa. And we're very much looking forward to other opportunities to work together in this area and be eager to get uh, the thoughts of all of you uh, as well. Um, so we're you know, eager uh, for this, uh, for this uh, gathering. Uh, we're confident that uh, we at USAID are going to learn an awful lot. I regret very much I will not be able to stay for the whole session, but I look forward to uh, getting uh, your report. I'm sure Dan will put together a fine publication. Um, and uh, you know, really, this is a real opportunity uh, for all of you to, to help shape uh, what USAID does, uh, what JICA does, and what we can uh, all do uh, together. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mark. And um, I'm glad the microphone is now. I, I sound much clearer now than I did before. <laughs>
Um, and I should have recognized Dan Rundy, my colleague uh, in charge of the prosperity uh, uh, program here at uh, CSIS, and the Japan chair, uh, who are also helping to organize this conference. So we, uh, we appreciate uh, this ability and this, this opportunity to collaborate. So if we could now move to the first panel, if I could ask the, uh, the first panelists, uh, the first four panelists to come up to the stage, and um, I will join you over there. I think we have uh, name tags. Here I am again. Um, so um, I am, uh, again, delighted to have uh, such an eclectic and interesting group of uh, panelists up here uh, uh, to, to join me for this first conversation, uh, where we're going to look back uh, at 60 years of development experience, look at uh, what the changes in the, in the world, the changes in the development field, um, in uh, the approaches to development around the world, and in particular, uh, Japan and the United States' role, uh, both individually and together, in, in addressing some of those challenges, and, uh, and I hope celebrating some of the progress achieved, uh, recognizing that there's still a lot of work to be done, which will be the subject of the second, uh, the second panel. So you should have biographical information information in front of you, so I won't give uh, extensive biographies of, of all of our speakers, but let me just go down the line here in, in the order that people will speak. Uh, so first, Keiichiro Nakazawa, who is the uh, representative, the chief representative in Washington of JICA, uh, Japan's uh, Development Assistance Agency. Uh, he will uh, speak first and, and talk about some of that history. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, the Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States, Ambassador Jose Cuisia, who is a good friend and neighbor of ours. I can literally, from where I'm sitting, I can see his embassy uh, across the street. And so we're delighted to uh, have him join us here uh, and to give his perspective on these issues. Uh, to my left is, and your right, is uh, Professor Yoshiaki Abe, who is a former, well, he's uh, formerly, as you'll see in your program, emeritus and university professor at Waseda University, but he actually uh, worked for a long time at the World Bank and is, in fact, writing a book about uh, Japan's experience in the World Bank. Uh, he lives in Chevy Chase, I think. So he's doing that, uh, that work and research locally, which is, uh, which is wonderful, and we're delighted to have Professor Abe with us uh, as well. And then uh, to my far left, your far right, Janet Valentine, who is a former senior advisor to the administrator at USAID, and uh, like Professor Abe, uh, is the agency's historian, uh, not only unofficially, but I learned today officially, uh, has written a book or edited a book about uh, USAID, and we're going to have a program on this coming up. When is that, Dan? In March. In March. Okay, so stay tuned for that. We're going to have a, a, a rollout um, of that. Uh, very soon. So Janet's going to talk about uh, these issues from a USAID perspective. So I think it's a, a very interesting group of uh, people, as you can hear, with a lot of experience. And uh, you've heard enough of me, so let me uh, start with Nakazawa-san. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Matthew, and uh, I also thank uh, to CSS for organizing this event. Now, it's a good opportunity uh, to look back on Japan's official development assistance over the past 60 years and discuss how uh, we can use this experience and lessons learned to meet today's and future's challenges. We have a lot of challenges, as you know. Uh, according to the Angus Madison's estimate, Japan's per capita GDP was 2,582 US dollars when Japan started providing ODA in 1954. It's uh, 1990's uh, PPP uh, purchasing per parity, 2,582. It was a quarter of Americans' per capita GDP back then and was equal to the UK's per capita GDP in 1855 
a century before. So I could say that our ODA started as South-South cooperation. And to tell other developing countries about our experiences of catching up to the Western uh, countries has always been a unique characteristics of Japanese ODA. It's also important to note at the beginning that over this 60-year period, Japan has provided its development assistance with a conscious awareness of, of Japan's place in the world. Let me explore what I mean by that by reviewing our ODA history in a little bit more depth. We often think of uh, ODA in three distinct phases. To tell the truth, this is a copy of what my boss said. <laughs> the first 20 years until the mid-70s uh, corresponds with Japan's post-war inte integration into the international community. During this period, the nation settled peace treaties with various countries, paid reparations or quasi-reparations to several Asian countries, and made efforts to be recognized as a responsible partner to the rest of the world. It's within this context that Japan started its ODA to neighboring Asian countries in 1954. It was also true back then that ODA was used to expand export markets for Japan and to secure natural resources for its survival and for its own development. By the, end, by the middle of the 70s, Japan's ODA moved into the second phases. At this point, Japan had become the second largest economy in the so-called free world next to uh, the US. As an emerging economic power, Japan began to take on an increasingly important role in the maintenance of the international system. Western countries' invitation to Japan to join the first G6 uh, summit in 1975 demonstrated global expectations that Japan should serve as a responsible and prominent member among the advanced economies. Again, ODA was a symbol of Japan's willingness to, pay, to play that role. Uh, Prime Minister Takeo Fukuda announced in 1977 that Japan would enhance its support for Southeast Asia, conducting its efforts in the spirit of heart-to-heart -heart relationship with people in the region. By the late 70s, Japan set the uh, goal of doubling its ODA and achieved it. Again in the early 80s, and time and again in the late 80s, Japan pledged to double its ODA and managed to do so. This rapid increase of Japan's ODA, later called as financial or capital recycling program, was Japan's effort to achieve harmonious economic relations with other countries. This was particularly important for the Japan-US relationship, as Japan had a huge trade surplus with the US in the late 80s in the early 90s. The national security strategy of the United States in 1988, written under the Ronald Reagan administration, appreciated this effort by Japan, stating, a recent positive development is Japan's significantly increased expenditures on foreign assistance. Japan continues to target assistance on countries of strategic importance and is giving more of its aid in untied form than in the past. By 1989, <coughs> excuse me, partly helped by the Japanese Yen's appreciation against the US dollar after the Plaza Agreement in 85, Japan had become the biggest bilateral ODA donor in the world. Japan remained the top ODA donor until the turn of the century. Finally, the third phase of Japan's ODA from the 1990s onward reflects a period when Japan had achieved the status of responsible, mature economic power. It's also this period when the Asian economic miracle started attracting a lot of attention in spite of the financial crisis of 1997. Today, many African countries are trying to learn from Asia's experience with the economic transformation and industrial development. Over this 60-year period, Japan has provided its assistance in response to evolving development theories and practice and to the changing development landscape. 
For example, when meeting basic human needs emerged as a priority in the 1970s, Japan expanded its assistance in the education and the health sector. In the 90s, when structural adjustment lending became popular to stabilize economies and promote economic reform in developing countries, Japan was the biggest co-financier with the World Bank next to none. Japan has also worked together with the US to address emerging transnational issues since the 1990s. The Prime Minister Miyazawa and President Bill Clinton launched the Common Agenda for Cooperation in Global Perspective in 1993, and the two countries collaborated in areas as diverse as health and population, environment, narcotic drug trafficking, technology, and economic development. Through our experiences, we have learned a lot. The East Asian miracle taught us the importance of political leadership supported by competent and dedicated technocrats. Without sound private-public partnership, either government or the market, or maybe both, fails. Human capital is always the foundation of development, et cetera, et cetera. However, that being said, a more striking thing about Japanese ODA is how Japan's philosophy and approach to developing assistance has remained quite consistent throughout these 60 years as a donor. Assistance tools and analytical tools have been developed and improved. Synergies among various tools have been maximized. Partnership and policy dialogue with developing countries and among donors have deepened. Yet, I would argue that our long-standing development thoughts, perhaps once considered unusual, have gradually become mainstreamed in the development discourse. Let me point out two distinguishing characteristics of Japanese ODA enshrined in the Japanese, uh, Japan's ODA charter to explain the fundamentals of our assistance. The first characteristic uh, is our basic policy to support the self-help efforts of developing partner countries. In other words, Japan has always placed a high value on country ownership. We have gradually increased our active involvement in policy dialogue to share views on what actions should be prioritized, where the recipient government could be doing better, and what Japan can do to help. Our advice during these dialogues is often based on our own experiences of catching up with the Western industrialization and what can be practically achieved in each specific context to produce tangible development results. However, we provide ODA to specific development projects and programs only after we receive formal requests from government of developing partner countries based on their own development plan. When we assist development project, we devote our attention to support from behind, not to read, not to read from behind. For example, we have supported many countries to develop basic roads. Our legal experts provide their counterparts examples of roads enacted in several other countries for comparison. They offer com commentaries on the different characteristics of each row and discuss with the counterparts about the rationale behind the differences and how they can be adapted in their country. But I, our experts rarely draft the roads by themselves, rather, they patiently watch over their counterparts' attempts to, do, to draft them. It often takes years, not months, to complete this process by trial and error. We have learned that development can be seen as a process where knowledge, technologies, and systems, which were often innovated in advanced countries, are introduced and integrated into developing countries. But donors cannot simply impose external solutions. Innovations must be adapted to the local context, and the integration process has to be planned, implemented, monitored, and adjusted by the recipient governments and their people in order to be sustainable. Based on Japan's own experience, we believe that is, uh, it is only through such process of adaptation that our counterparts can truly own the pr development process and can generate development results. We have the utmost respect for this integration and learning process 
and we support these self-help efforts on the ground. The second defining characteristic of Japanese ODA is our continuous priority on supporting sustainable growth through investment in infrastructure and human capital. This includes investment, investment in hard infrastructure such as roads, ports, and power stations, but also in governance infrastructure such as legal and justice systems, and in, in human resource development. We don't think development is to find industries where each country has comparative advantage based on its natural endowment or its history. The East Asian experience tells us that development is a dynamic process by which each country has to continuously climb up the industrial ladder by increasing productivity and adding value in order to sustain growth in a very competitive environment. However, we have learned that dynamic market economies do not arise nor to develop just by removing government controls. Given the pressure created by globalization, there is a need of a strong state capacity to build infrastructure, to invest in human capital, and to establish a regulatory environment where private industry can thrive and where populations can reap the rewards. That's why we will continue to emphasize country ownership backed by self-help self efforts and infrastructure and human capital development as a foundation of our assistance. This is by no means an exhaustive summary uh, of our experience and lessons learned in the last six, six decades. Several important issues, such as human security, peace building, and private sector engagement have been attracting our, atten our attention for over a decade. I would be happy to share some of our thoughts on these issues if we have more time, but I believe my time is running short, and uh, I know Matthew is on the verge of stopping me. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nakazawa-san. If you want another minute, you can have it. I just want to show you that I'm a generous moderator. No, no. OK, no, well, seriously, we'll have time to ha um, have more discussion um, after the, uh, the other panelists have spoken. And you can uh, feel free to jump back into the conversation. Ambassador Quizio, you may stay there. It's Matt Goodman. Ms. Mark Perstein, Dr. Akihiko Tanaka, my esteemed co-panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First, I wish to congratulate Matt and the CSIS for organizing this U.S. Japan Development Summit. As uh, Ambassador of the Philippines to the U.S., I'm pleased to be a part of this forum. I think it is important for this summit to show the experience of ODA recipient countries and I'm glad to talk about our own experience. Development cooperation between the Philippines and Japan started in 1954 when Japan joined the Colombo Plan, and even before we established official um, diplomatic relations in 1956. As of 2012, uh, Japan is the top ODA loan source of the Philippines and among the top development partners in terms of ODA grants. The dynamic cooperation between the Philippines and Japan reflects the excellent bilateral relations between our two countries. In September 20, 2011, two countries confirmed that the relations had developed into a strategic partnership. Japan is only one of two strategic partners of the Philippines, the other one being the United States. For, the, for Japan, the Philippines is an important partner in East Asia, as our countries share the same values of democracy and market economy, as well as common strategic interests. The Philippines is also an important country in terms of geographical and regional security because it lies along vital sea lanes. Given this, Japan believes that the sustainable growth of the Philippines will redound to the stability and prosperity in East Asia. Our economic relations are also robust, with the Philippines providing the necessary economic base for many Japanese companies. We also began implementing the Japan-Philippines Economic Partnership Agreement in 2011. The people-to-people -people connections are, all, are, as, are, as, are as significant with Japan as, as the top third source of tourists in the Philippines, about 412,474 in 2012, and approximately 200,000 Filipinos living in Japan. 
Through the decades, Japanese ODA has been contributing to Philippine development efforts in many fields. ODA pro projects are covered under the four priority areas of Japanese ODA to the Philippines, namely, one, strengthening of the economic structure for sustainable growth, mitigation of disparities, both poverty alleviation and mitigation of regional disparities, three, environmental conservation and disaster preparedness, and four, human resources development and institution building. From 1967 to 2008, the cumulative amount of J Japanese ODA to the Philippines reached $20.56 billion, making the Philippines the fourth largest recipient of Japanese ODA next to Indonesia, China, and India. Apart from bilateral ODA, Japan also funnels other assistance to the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and UN agencies. As of 2012, Japan was the biggest source of ODA loans to the Philippines, accounting for 37% of the total loan portfolio. This is our own loans portfolio. The total ODA loan from Japan was $3.261 billion, accounting for 21 loans. To illustrate, the second largest source was the World Bank with 21% and the ADB with a 13% share. Most of the new loans that became part of the 2012 portfolio were sourced from JICA, and for this I want to thank Dr. Tanaka, amounting to $943 million for seven loans. This included one fully availed program loan, the Development Policy Support Program Investment Climate, worth $96.41 million. In the past 10 years, from 2003 to 2012, JICA was the third largest source of new loans at $3.09 billion. In terms of grants, Japan was the sixth top development partner of the Philippines, accounting for 3.36% for of total ODA grant portfolio, or $95.83 million. Beneficiaries of Japanese ODA to the Philippines. The country assistance evaluation conducted by Nomura Institute for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan noted that Japan's ODA has mainly targeted the improvement of infrastructure, in particular, the transport sector, which accounts for 35% of total yen loans on a cumulative basis. Examples include the construction of the 2,100-kilometer Philippines-Japan Friendship Highway, or the Philippines, Pan-Philippines Highway, in, 1960, in 1968, and Terminal 2 of the Nino Aquino International Airport in 1994. The second Mandawe Mactan Bridge in Cebu, which connects Cebu City to Mactan Island, where we have two export processing zones, is another very successful project. The study noted that the large sums of assistance provided by Japan, targeted mainly into infrastructure, was significant to the Philippines' development. And for that, we are, again, grateful to the Japanese government. In 2012, Japan released its country assistance policy for the Philippines. In the country-specific policy intervention, Japan will help Philippines achieve inclusive growth, as described in the Philippine Development Plan 2011-2016, and strengthen the strategic partnership between our two countries. The country assistance policy recognized the significant growth achieved by the Philippines and described the Philippines as, and I quote, at the stage of entering into a middle-income country, unquote. Notwithstanding these developments, Japan believes that the Philippines will continue to need assistance in addressing issues that will help the country achieve more vigorous and sustainable growth. The country assistance policy outlined the following priority areas. One, achieving sustainable economic growth through further promotion of investment, Two, overcoming vulnerability and stabilizing basis for human life and production activity. Three, peace and development in Mindanao. I take this opportunity to commend the government of Japan for its support for Mindanao. This has been seen through Japan's active participation in the peace process between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front Japan is the only country that is a member of both the International Contact Group 
and the international monitoring team in Mindanao. Furthermore, Japan's support can be felt on the ground through the Japan Bansamoro Initiative for Reconstruction and Development, or Jaybird, not Jailbird, but Jaybird. <laughs> Since its launch in 2006, Jaybird has supported 66 grassroots projects in conflicted, affected areas in Mindanao in the amount of $5.5 million. Jaybird projects come in through grant aid, technical cooperation, and loans. Notwithstanding the implementation of the ODA projects and programs, no bureaucracy is perfect. Thus, challenges remain. Based on the Philippines' own review, ODA projects in general are hampered by implementation issues such as startup delays, budget and funds flow bottlenecks, prolonged pro procurement um, problems in getting right of way, particularly for um, road projects, and local government-related issues. Furthermore, our National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, conducted an ODA portfolio review in 2012 and noted that the need to improve our, dis our disbursement levels and availment rates across ODA projects is very much needed. The review showed that the overall disbursement level was at 68.71%, lowest in the past 10 years, and lower than the 70% benchmark. The 2012 availment rate of 72.45%, while above the 70% benchmark, resulted in an availment backlog of $1.51 billion. The implementing agencies with the highest contribution to the availment backlog were also among the five agencies that have the highest contribution to the disbursement shortfall. The review also observed that the current portfolio, it takes an average of two years for a project to disburse the first 10% of its loan commitment. Data showed that JICA-assisted projects required longer time to disperse the first 10% of loan amounts with an average of 2.23 years. Notwithstanding these challenges, the Philippine government is committed to the efficient and effective implementation of development assistance projects. Right now, it's doing so by strengthening the monitoring and evaluation of ODA projects. In the case of Japanese ODA, the implementing agencies, as well as the local governments, meet with JICA Philippines to monitor and evaluate projects in order to address disbursement and availment issues. Based on the 2011 evaluation by Nomura, JICA's Philippine office is its only overseas office to have set up an online monitoring system working closely with the government implementing agencies. Another area to further develop is working with international stakeholders such as non-government organizations or NGOs tapping their grassroots next networks and extensive knowledge of the situation on the ground would help in speeding up action and providing assistance well customized to the needs of the people. A model to build on is JICA's project on peace building through education in Mindanao. An incentive for implementing agencies to successfully complete ODA projects is to institutionalize a program of recognizing their good practices. NEDA's current Good Practice Awards is a good basis for this. The Philippines is grateful for the assistance extended by the government of Japan for the past 60 years. From the completion of payment of our war reparations to the Philippines in 1976, development cooperation between the Philippines and Japan has certainly come a long way and continues to this day. It is in this light that we acknowledge the statement of the Prime Minister of Japan Prime Minister Abe, during the visit of President Benigno Aquino III in September 2011, that Japan will continue its assistance to the Philippines as an important ODA target country. We'll continue to work to improve and maximize official development assistance that we receive, and we look forward to continued cooperation with our friends in Japan in this regard. I want to thank you for um, giving me the opportunity participate in this panel today. Thank you. <clears throat>
Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. That was a very helpful uh, overview of, of Japan and the Philippines partnership, really, on development, which I think is, uh, is um, a very sort of clear example of how, uh, how Japan uh, operates in the region and, and more broadly in the world. So we really appreciate that, and I have a question for you later. Okay. Um, so let me um, pass it to uh, Professor Abe. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank uh, CSIS and Mr. Goodman to let me talk to you this morning on the very important subject. My responsibility, according to Mr. Goodman, when he called me, I have to talk about evaluation of ODA collaboration between US and Japan for 60 years. It's not an easy job. So I'm going to simplify it, the most important terms of reference in my own way so that I can have a real communication between you and myself. And just additional uh, information. When you look at uh, my biography, I'm currently, op I'm doing my advertisement, by the way. Um, I work for USJI. And Mr. Tanaka used to be the president of that organization. I'm an operating advisor of the United States Japan Research Institute. Um, it's organized by eight Japanese universities, four national universities and four private universities, in order to increase the volume of Japanese opinions um, in terms of uh, uh, relationships between U.S., Japan, and, and policy issues, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that I'm related to USJI. That is a quite hoping that quite it becoming important NGO in Washington, D.C. Okay, let's get into the topic. Or oh, one more joke, I have to say. <laughs> you say... Everything is 60 years commemoration. I wanted to become 60 years old so I, I can be younger. Um, and I, I even know Mr. Tanaka is going to become 60 years old. And JICA is a 60 years old organization. So it's an interesting number, 60 years old, <coughs> or 60. Now, what I'm going to explain to you on my, um, in my mind how his question is uh, maturing or integrating or disintegrating in my mind on the evaluation of ODA collaboration between Japan and the United, uh, Japan and the United States in the field of economic development. Let's look at Japan's experience, whether that is relevant or not, so that I can bring everybody to the main point. Japanese economic development had a unique historical experiences, particularly after World War II. Our constitution, nine, prohibited us to be engaged in international war. And as a result of that constitution, our budget on military-related business is very, very low. So if you look at the annual uh, report of uh, uh, Swedish uh, NGOs uh, uh, military budget uh, report, the position of Japan is very peaceful. And it was, luckily or unluckily, given situation to Japan, using that opportunity and other historical experiences such as Korean War and Vietnam War, we had extra public investment to be made in order to assist United uh, Nations forces in various countries. Given that situation in the 50s and 60s, Japan made a good effort 
to make herself successful economic development. And just remember that historical unique circumstances we have to remember to evaluate what happened in Japan so that it will, of course, bring to the um, economic development issue on behalf of developing countries. But just I would like to let you remember that. Now, the result of uh, that economic development was, again, in comparison with other Asian countries, the experiences were quite similar. The common result that economic development had in most East Asian countries were characterized by small income disparity and small number of uh, the very poor. And that these were the result of set of policy implementation having achieved high savings ratio, resulting investments in creating physical assets, improved productivity in the agriculture sector, and the reduction in population growth, improved education in primary junior high school, improved manufacturing productivity through the introduction of uh, new technology, and increased life expectancy. All these experiences in developing countries in East Asia looks like, A, it, they were similar to Japanese. What are the relationships, logical relationships between Japanese experiences and experiences in developing countries? I don't think we can generalize the experiences. That is going to be my thesis presenting to you. And what I'm going to say is this. Each country, as Japan had unique historical circumstances, which led to high growth rate, and similarly to other developing countries, with their unique, each country's background and unique circumstances, they made their own economic development. What I'm trying to say is, I would like to be modest on the evaluation of Japan, United States collaboration in the development efforts in developing countries. In other words, each country's experiences are the key to development, suggesting that detailed analysis of country situation, local situations are the must. And I'm going to give you, it's, it's a very simple model, so you can laugh at uh, that model, but think of local community in any of uh, and a developing country. Local community without having, let's say, clean water. ODA can give you clean water by providing water system simple, um, well uh, system can be provided. But when we say water system, it should continue to live in that village for the life of that asset, say 10 years, 15 years. I went through this, so that's why I, <laughs> perhaps too specific, but anyway. This model is very important. Water is there, but usually water facet is located in, the, in front of village chiefs 
house. And he is going to, village chief is going to be the distributor of water. It's not going to work. So we learned how to distribute water democratically. And the job of the ladies in the village is going to be more important than before. And how to convince this village chief to understand ladies' participation is more important. In theoretical mind, ah, anthropological knowledge is important. But anthropological knowledge is important not in general, for that society is important. Unless lady teacher, women's teacher, comes to that village in the kindergarten or pre-kindergarten education, and the girls will not come to the school in this type of local village. You have to convince central government and state government to beg them to bring in ladies' teacher so that girls come to the school in the community. Even that is difficult. Once ladies' teacher start coming to the villages, and once small schools in little villages have a toilet for girl students, the water start to be used properly, and the girl students go back to go back home, and she explains to mother how to wash hands and how to wash diapers, and then in few months, few months, the diarrhea occurrence goes down in few months. Now, how many of us knew that kind of gambit? The whole system during 1960s, we didn't know. Even in 70s, it wasn't part of our ODA. Water supply was included, of course. But to let ladies' teacher go in a particular village, that's the effort and knowledge shared by the villagers and the institutions in the developing countries and the government, including government itself of a developing country. In other words, unique situation of uh, a World Bank used to say country analysis is important. Oh, I agree. Nobody can disagree. But I'm getting into deeper, deeper localization of knowledge accumulation is the most important thing. And we are catching up with that. And I would like to, since uh, Mr. Nakazawa is here and USAID uh, key people, key persons are here, I can say it's going. But what I'm going to beg and propose is let's go deeper. Is that's one uh, recommendation. One more uh, recommendation I would like to have or is when I proposed this, when I was active in the World Bank, people laughed at me. So I don't know. I'm going to try again here uh, 20 years later. When I was teaching economics in Waseda, um, say 15 years ago, Mr. Yunus of Grameen Bank was giving a lecture on how he was effective in helping the poor. I asked him, when your applicants in the village come to your agent, does she or does he have to apply in the written form? In other words, fulfill application forms. 
And he said, of course. In another words, the poor in Bangladesh had to write and read. But most of the illiterate can't read and can't write. I hope by now his Grameen Bank's application form to borrow money can be done by looking at pictures and you make a choice whether you are a girl or a boy and how long you would like to, how much and what to do. I think you can find a convenient format to explain borrower's choice and applicant choice and application form can be completed in that way. I don't think what I'm saying is important for doing, actually developing um, specific spe uh, application form for that purposes. But what I'm saying is to understand the issue in that way, to get into deeper on the poverty issues is the important matter. Indeed, in Africa, if you check the history book, there are societies exist without having letters. There is a judicial system, government system, et cetera, et cetera. But if we use United States and Japanese collaboration, we use our knowledgeable, heavy set of uh, intellectualism. If we push on how to think, the development way of uh, illiterate society, we assume that it has to be done in our way, having law, region and all that, perhaps, perhaps <coughs> there could be a case to develop a society, better society, without having literate documents for managing the country and the society. And I'm not saying it can be I'm not saying I'm rejecting our own knowledge and intellectualism. Of course, I'm with you. But within that, what I'm begging is to let you understand that is a possibility to look at deeper. Um, these two are my... Um, suggestions, and just one more additional point I forgot to mention. Uh, one of the collaborating efforts between Japan and the uh, uh, United States in ODA is debt reduction. And I'm, and a lot of uh, cases, uh, they communicate very well on uh, how to achieve um, um, uh, debt reduction. For example, recently there was an incident in Myanmar. Now, how much they are going to, both countries are going to reduce specifically, I can't, I'm not permitted to say, but there, there was a beautiful collaboration in helping Myanmar. So there is a interesting development in that area also. But uh, please think of my uh, simple suggestions or two points. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Abe Sensei. And um, I think that you've touched on an important point about local knowledge, and, and which but leads to a question that I want to ask about sort of the trade-offs involved, because the deeper you go, the harder it is to go broad, and so you have to prioritize. So um, I, I wonder how people address that. But um, let, let's let uh, Janet um, bat clean up, and, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. 
Great. Well, it's, uh, thank you, Matt, and I'd like to thank CSIS for putting this together. Um, this is the first time I've been in your wonderful new building, and it's uh, um, very impressive. Uh, you have attracted a very impressive panel here and a very impressive audience. Um, it's a great honor to be with this distinguished panel to muse over 60 years of development experience. Um, I'm particularly pleased that we're engaging in this exercise in conjunction with the U.S.-Japan Development Summit. If there's one thing that we've learned over the past 60 years, it's that development is hard. There's no other way to put it, it's hard. And the assistance provider nations can work best when we talk to each other and develop with recipient nations programs that are efficient and effective. But I think the lesson we have all learned over these years is you can't do it alone. You can, but you're not gonna get any results. Uh, the U.S. and Japan have a long and rich and critically important bilateral engagement. During the December 3rd meeting in Tokyo, Vice President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe highlighted several aspects of our global partnership. Humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, development assistance, and global security. All three of these kind of mush together when you are, get into the actual implementation of international programs. USAID and JICA have long been partners in the field. My first encounter with JICA was in the 80s, early 80s in, in Nepal, when we worked together in the health sector. And over the succeeding years, it's been my pleasure to engage with JICA on development strategies and programs in Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. Every country that is engaged in development assistance has its own history, its successes and failures, and its own learning curve. I was my last job in aid before I went out to pasture was uh, editing uh, a book called The 50, 50 Years of, of U.S. Uh, Development Assistance, USAID's Assistance, and gathered together first-person stories from about 140 people going back to 1961 and up through some of the interns that are working in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. For me, it was a wonderful experience because I could look back over a, a very rich history, an evolving history, and I, I divided the book into decades. And I think, you know, with an introduction, you can really see the evolution of U.S. foreign assistance over that, that period. For, for purposes of, of, of explanation, I, I divide U.S. foreign assistance really into four categories. And for the first one, I've got to go back 66 years. I hope you will forgive me for... But modern U.S. development assistance was born following World War II with the Marshall Plan, which was designed to assist in the reconstruction of Western Europe. A look at the Marshall Plan, how it was conceived, how it was funded, how it was managed, show to me in many ways how development assistance should be. Even now, 62 years after the plan was concluded, <clears throat> there are very important lessons to learn. First of all, funding needs to be adequate. <clears throat> At $15 billion, the Marshall Plan constituted 3% of GDP. We are, the U.S. Uh, 150 account, which includes State Department, uh, the economic assistance of the Treasury, all international, <laughs> is about 1% of that. They say it's 1%, I think it's actually less. <clears throat> but it's about the Marshall Plan on a yearly basis, about four times what we commit to development efforts all around the globe. So if we wonder why the Marshall Plan was a success, first of all, you just look at the magnitude of it. Um, every time there's a crisis in the world, and I've heard this over years, what we need is a Marshall Plan for Haiti. Last week we heard there's, we need a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. We've needed Marshall Plans all over the world. Really? Are we going to put 3% of GDP into helping Ukraine or Haiti? Um, 
history is an elusive mistress, they say, but it would be nice if people banding about the name of the Marshall Plan would have a little more experience. <coughs> a second thing that a lesson <coughs> is that each recipient country of the Marshall Plan had its own detailed plan for recovery that was worked out in advance and that was signed off, written off, by both the U.S. and the recipient. So there were no surprises that the United States didn't suddenly say, well, you know what you really need is uh, a community health system or a program in political party development. That wasn't part of the, of the blueprint. And the blueprint was followed. And when you came to the end of it, that was it. And the third is from beginning to end, there was always an exit plan. It was four years over and out. When we look at some of, of the US government programs that go on uh, now around the globe, you can trace their history and their origins back 20 to 30 years. If there's no plan for exit, if you don't define success, you're going to find that everything is stretched out and probably the original intent is going to be lost. The second phase of, of US uh, cooperation, and this is modern, I mean, aid, US government and, and private aid goes back you know, practically to the founding of the, the, the country. But in modern aid, the second phase was the birth of USAID, which took place with the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 is one of the keystones of President John F. Kennedy's short tenure. Several situations would guide the underpinnings for the next 28 years, when the third stage starts. First of all, one of the major underpinnings and the concerns was countering communism. In 1952, two years before the Foreign Assistance Act, we suddenly had a communist entity in the Western Hemisphere something that President Monroe, with his doctrine, would be turning over in his grave about. But communism, we saw as a spreading threat, and the most likely next uh, uh, pins in the to roll would be in Latin America. So through the Alliance for Progress, which was under the uh, Foreign Assistance Act, we suddenly you know, beefed up US assistance to keep them from turning communist. Um, when I was in Nicaragua, as, as part of that actually, I remember President Reagan coming up with the statement that, Harlan, that Managua, Nicaragua was closer to Harlingen, Texas than Harlingen, Texas was to Washington. That was supposed to scare the bejesus out of us, I guess, that Harlingen, Texas and Managua were going to be the the axes for the new takeover of, uh, of the communists. The, the second, and this isn't as, as important as countering communism, was the emergence of the new African sovereignties. As a European decolonization led to new sovereign states in Africa, it signaled the fact that development was no longer about sovereigns managing their possessions, but it's about rich nations helping poor ones catch up. So one of the stated goals in the Foreign Assistance Act was the elimination of extreme poverty. Where have we heard that? The earlier Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, put Asia in the uh, forefront of development concerns. So the, these, these 28 years from 61 really to uh, 1989, Development assistance was almost exclusively the territory of USAID. Aid had bilateral missions in 85 countries in Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. And for the most part, that, that, that period, assistance was largely decentralized. There, there was a strong policy shop in Washington, but decisions on programming uh, left largely to the field. Uh, the personnel assigned to the field missions were people who had appropriate language skills and experience in the region where they worked. 
until the mid 80s to, to the 90s, I'm not sure when the, the, the change occurred, US aid personnel were the key interlocutors with host country personnel. They had the technical skills appropriate to programs. There were very few personal services contractors and almost no institutional contractors that aid personnel, in conjunction with State Department, of course, um, carried out the business of international development. This is something that is, has flipped greatly in, in recent years. Um, there are lessons to be learned from this period under the Foreign Assistance Act. One, where programs are a mile wide and an inch deep, you're probably not going to meet all of your goals. The aid looked at the world in terms of the myriad problems and set out to, to cure all of them. Um, a second lesson was the decentralized approach, empowering the field missions who work most closely with the host government is the approach to, uh, of managing assistance, leads to more agility in the field and more agility to probably more success. And the third, that the closer the coordination with the host government, the most, more likely the success. These were the precursors to the Accra and Busan Accords, which recognized that the host country should be in the driver's seat. The third phase, which added a whole new flavor, was transition in the post-communist world. Imagine an agency that was set up to, to fight and, and deter the spread of communism. We wake up one day and the communists are all gone, well, most of them. Um, so what do you do? You retool. You take uh, a, a large segment of that, the people who've been fighting communism, the aid personnel, and you turn them into generalists to go and work in the, trans uh, the transition world. Um, we opened up in a, a series of about two years about 30 new USAID overseas missions in every country of the former Soviet Union and um, the Eastern Communist Bloc. At that time, there were three people in the entire agency that spoke Russian. I was not one of them, but they sent me to Russia anyhow. And um, I must say that it was very fortunate for me that the Russians have been busy studying English. They must have known something was going to happen, and so that we could get the things done. But it was a very different atmosphere. And in a second, I think, lesson that came out of that is that in terms of reading the de desires and the hopes of the recipient nations, the U.S. missed a lot. Um, in, in Russia, if I can, I can speak, there was a great interest in economic restructuring and restructuring of the health system. And then we talked about our third pillar, which was democratization and human rights. And you can imagine the, the, the reaction of the Russians to that is that, thank you very much that we really are going to handle that ourselves. You know, we want the technical transfer. We don't want your ideologies. Um, we had enough of the former going on when I was there that we stayed. And as budgets have gone down, sadly left to the USAID being asked to leave Russia last year. <clears throat> the fourth and the last stage, which we're in now, is post 9-11. The global war on terror and the growing of US foreign assistance to countries in crisis. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan are the ones that, that immediately come to mind. Um, and basically having aid missions established in the middle of, of nations that were at war. Having aid people serving on provisional reconstruction teams embedded with the military, learning a whole new language. Um, and you know, somehow in the midst of these crises, creating the conditions for sustainable 
e economic and social development. Um, this period is not over, so I will not comment on the lessons learned, <laughs> but I think we can all kind of guess what some of these are going to be. Um, overall, looking back on these 66 years, I think the most important lesson that I'm not sure that we've learned is that I'm, I'm a great believer in the wisdom of Georges Santayana, that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We see repetition of past mistakes all of the time because we choose not to remember. It's unclear to me whether USAID over these 60, 50 years has really learned from the past. We invent the same wheel time and time again, and each time we declare a new initiative. I couldn't have said this a year ago. <laughs> but I don't think anybody would really disagree. That, um, and just as the second is, is this, this, just as parents, we learn early on about the importance of unity of command that mom and dad are the command center, and you don't have two messages going out to your children. Because the children really like it when you get two messages. And they have a choice of whether they eat their dinner or they don't. Um, and consistency. So you must have the unity of command, I believe, and consistency in developing ag development agencies. Back when aid was, was first set up and for the first 28 years, aid was the development agency of the United States. It is now what it calls itself the premier agency, development agency in the United States. And there are 20 other government agencies that also do international development. Um, at times there can be confusion within our own government of to who runs the health program in a, in a specific country. Um, this is, is something that probably will not be reversed, but again, we've learned to coordinate with our other donors, with our host country nationals. We need to learn to coordinate better with ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. A lot of rich food for thought, and, and um, I'm burning to ask everyone uh, uh, several questions, but, but despite that promise, uh, because I know um, others in the audience have questions, I'm going to defer all but one uh, question inspired by the combination of what uh, you, Janet, and Abe-sensei said about um, lessons learned. Uh, but, but Abe-san's sort of challenge to that on some level, at least that's the way I interpret it, that, that there's a limit to what you can learn generally. You have to actually understand locally, you know, the specific idiosyncrasies of, of a particular uh, place and a set of challenges locally. So inspired by that, I want to ask uh, Nakazawa-san and um, Ambassador Kwesia uh, about Japan's own experience and whether that as a country that emerged from, you know, devastation at the end of World War II, uh, whether on the Japan side, the extent to which your own experience uh, informed your approach to ODA over these 60 years when you went to the Philippines or places in Africa or, or, or other countries, to what extent was your own experience uh, in, in um, developing applied and relevant to what you were doing in those countries. And for Ambassador Kwesia, same question in reverse. To what extent do you think Japan's experience has been informative to the Philippines as a, uh, as a country struggling with some of these same issues? Very, two minutes, because I want to give the audience, <laughs> audience a chance to jump in. Thanks. Yeah, I agree, I agree with uh, Abe Sensei saying, uh, you know, every development is very uh, context specific. And uh, leader's strategy is very different from the follower's strategy. 
So I think you know Japanese experience, uh, significance of Japanese experience in terms of uh, our assistance to developing country is we are the one who you know caught up to the Western nations, and we know the forward strategy. But still, I again uh, agree with Abe-san's uh, remarks. You know, we have to go into deep and have to understand the context, very specific context surrounding environment. What does a global globalization means for the uh, like an infant industry, which needs to be developed for the purpose of development, and so on. So, uh, context-specific type of issues need to be again understood, probably only by those you know uh, developing countries by themselves. That's why I insist on the importance of the uh, self-help efforts or to help those self-help self -help efforts. Thank you. Two minutes. Thank you. 90 seconds. That was very good. What we have seen is that um, I guess Japan having emerged also from a war, from devastation, they, they tend to be very understanding of our situation, particularly when they encounter resistance from local communities in certain projects, projects that, of course, will, will redound to the interests of the country. But sometimes the local communities have a more narrow view. And uh, we do encounter, they bring us to court, they bring the government to court to stop a project. But um, we see that, that the Japanese, our friends from JICA and the other agencies of the Japanese government tend to be a lot more understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to questions from the floor. We, we have officially 10 minutes, and I might cheat two or three minutes out of your coffee break uh, to allow for one or two additional questions. Uh, there are microphones, so if you do have a question, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you, and if you could um, identify, identify yourself and uh, genuinely ask a question, that would be helpful. Yes, sir. Uh, Gentlemen, just one second. We'll wait for the microphone, please. Hi, uh, Don Ritter, uh, president of the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce and uh, former member of Congress, go way back with Afghanistan uh, to when jihad was a good word. But I wanted to uh, just ask the panel members, the gaping hole uh, one sees in places like Afghanistan is the, with all of the aid monies that have gone in, uh, understanding that there's a war on, the, um, the gaping hole is the private sector and the market economy, the sustainable segment of society. And, uh, could you comment on uh, the perhaps inability? Is, is developing the market economy somewhat off the table when it comes to development? Is that development is hard, developing the sustainable market economy given that development is, uh, is coming from government sources. It's very difficult to engage with the private sector or engage the private sector or invest. Uh, and uh, this is, this is uh, if you look at, at Paul Brinkley's recent book, From Warfront to Storefront, um, it really, uh, you know, all these, uh, there's a lesson learned there that uh, um, with all that money, the, the private sector and the sustainable part when the aid is pulled out is neg rather negligible. Um, anyway, I'd like to get your comments on that, starting with you, Janet. It'd be great. Thank you. I wish I knew more about, the, about Afghanistan. I, I did not serve in that bureau. I, I know about as much of it as many people here who read the papers. I have read the Inspector General report, and I have read um, the the book by the Washington Post reporter. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, I'm I'm not sure how you carry out in a development program in the midst of the kind of civil combat that is going on. I'm not sure that it is classified as a war anymore. But boy, when you pick up the paper, it sure sounds like it. Um, I know a number of aid contractors that have tried to set up small businesses uh, that have looked at, at programs that would develop the natural resources. And 
I think the, the jury is out as to whether any of them are going to make it until there is some sort of stability and some sort of, of, of peace. I wish I knew more about it, but that's not a very good answer right now. Unfortunately, she has taken an early coffee break, but um, Abigail Friedman, who will be on the next panel, uh, served in Afghanistan and, and I think has, uh, is going to speak a little bit about that uh, in her remarks. So maybe, Don, you make sure you ask your question of Abigail when she comes back. Nagazawa, how would you like to? Thank you. Uh, I think, you know, what you know, aid agency has to uh, think about is sometimes, in the, you know, fragile states, post-conflict situation, is helped by uh, only the humanitarian type of aid and humanitarian aid agency. But that needs to be connected without gap to the development of uh, society, development of market, and for the development of market, as I uh, pointed out in my remarks, uh, government legitimacy and government uh, function, I believe, is very necessary. So even though it may take time, we have to, uh, you know, try to, uh, you know, develop one by one how we can make governance structure sound by providing uh, institutional development in a capacity building type of aid. But at the same time, uh, you know, as you pointed out, you know, at the end of the day, at the end, at the end of the day, uh, private sector is the one who will uh, make you know, economy uh, active and sustainable. So, you know, I'm sorry, I can't have the uh, you know, clear answer, but, you know, as an aid agency, we have to take care about both humanitarian, you know, aid under the post-conflict type of situation and development uh, type of assistance together with government and the private sector. Thank you. My name is Jeanine Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I thank all the panelists, especially Dr. Ballantin, for your service. Um, my question is, how do you think the lessons learned for the last six decades between the U.S. and Japan in developing countries would transfer into our new programs for developing countries in Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam? Thank you. Let me try in two minutes. Uh, for example, when we started uh, our assistance in Vietnam, what we studied you know, you know, deeply was our experience in Thailand, for example. You know, we you know, assisted to develop the uh, eastern seaboard in Thailand which is the outskirts of the Bangkok, uh, Maftaput, and Remucheban industrial area. And the lessons learned from there was utilized when we provided assistance to northern uh, Vietnam, which connected Hanoi to Haiphong port by National Highway 5 and the industrial estate or SEZ type of uh, development in order to promote the uh, you know, uh, export uh, you know, uh, export-oriented uh, uh, development in Hanoi, and which I believe was quite successful because of the effort by the Vietnam people and Vietnamese government. Thank you. Uh, David Sadney, formerly with the Defense and State Departments. Uh, my question is about uh, another country that got the Olympics, did the Olympics, but also continues to receive development aid, China. Uh, Japan has devoted a lot of effort to development assistance in China. Uh, the United States has basically not given any assistance to China. And I wonder whether the panelists have any thoughts on a place where uh, there's been a very different development model used uh, by Japan's efforts in the U.S.'s model, whether they have any thoughts on that. Uh, my name is uh, Dick Rosen. I'm with the uh, Council for a Community of Democracies. Uh, we have gotten from the panel some differences of opinion, I think, about the role of democracy as being among the objectives 
of development. Uh, on the one hand, Professor Abe gave a brilliant example of how democratic water uh, policy could be implemented by people participating in the process, particularly women and girls. Uh, from Professor Ballantine, we got the view that the Russians took great objection when you tried to ram democracy and human rights down their throats. Uh, it, my question is, are we not really talking about participation, uh, not about preaching democracy or human rights, but uh, if, you, if you will, taking the view that uh, people have this desire and demand to participate in their own governance one way or another. How they do it is up to them. Um, but it's not clear from the panel, and uh, it was certainly clear from Mr. Firestein's remarks that both elimination of extreme poverty and building de uh, democratic societies were the two key elements of development. So what are we really talking about? Thank you. Jim Gatton with the Japan Center for International Exchange. Um, I was glad to hear the common agenda mentioned earlier. Um, and under that, there are a lot of efforts between the US and Japan to create some deeper partnerships and run a lot of joint projects. And that was, of course, succeeded in the, you know, under the Bush administration by the US-Japan um, partnership on global health, um, which dug a bit deeper in a specific area. And I understand that JICA staff were, one was based in USAID, there was some attempt to do the opposite. Um, my sense is that that's, these types of really deep joint partnerships have diminished in recent years between the US and Japan. Um, and I want to get a sense, I mean, I'm tempted to ask, is, are, have we given up on this type of partnership? Um, but what I really want to know is, um, from the USAID and the JICA perspective of these joint attempts at joint projects, um, what were the costs of those and then what were the benefits of those? Thank you. Okay, so we have a question about China, uh, about democracy, and about uh, U.S.-Japan joint projects. Maybe we can go down the road if people uh, would like to offer thoughts on any of those three questions or anything else before we close. On uh, the question of China, um, USAID has a representative in China. As a matter of fact, Jennifer Adams was sitting over there, spent four years or three, four years as our representative. So what I would suggest, the best way to find out the dimensions of the US-China program would be to talk to her, because I don't have any idea. <laughs> anything else, anything the other ones? Oh, on, on the other ones, um, I think, you know, when we're talking about democratization, and you, you brought up Russia, I think you hit upon a key. It, democratization programs don't have to be elections, they don't have to be, you know, the, the kinds of, of governance issues that we often, but the, I think the key, and I would agree with you 100%, is participation. One of the growth industries in Russia during the time I was there was the uh, creation and formation of non-governmental organizations, of community organizations where people would get together and for the first time and look at environmental issues, and lo and behold, find out that the government would listen to them as an organization, but not as an individual. So I think that you know, that is the, 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 the keystone on which you can start building, but I think often we try and go from the top down rather than the bottom up. Um, joint projects, I think that um, I, when I, back when I was in aid, I know we had um, we, we, we still have an, an aid person who is attached to the embassy, but I don't believe we've embedded people. I think where the, um, the, the collaboration takes place more now is in the field. That the aid director in um, India gets to know the, the JICA person, and they, they look at coordination, they share uh, planning, and where each party has an interest, try to work out joint implementation. Comment on uh, de uh, democratization or pa participation. I, I don't want to use Im 
if you are in the field or if we are actively engaged in ODA, I don't want to use um, intellectual word like democratization. I think the important thing is somehow you have to develop an institution or institutions in the society where people work and somehow you have to let people to participate. And that must be the principle for success in any kind of endeavor for economic development. Thank you. Well, it's not. There it is. Uh, we are fully committed to democracy, and despite the difficulties we encounter in pushing projects, uh, we recognize the rights of uh, local communities, including the indigenous peoples who, who raise objections, for example, in the case of mining, while we have some very attractive mining properties that can be developed, indigenous peoples raise concerns, objections, they go to court, and in a democratic system, we have to work within that system. Um, under an, an, an author authoritarian system, like during the time of President uh, Marcos, things, projects could move on more quickly. But of course, uh, we know what happened during the Marcos years. So we believe that, that we would rather work within a democratic system despite all its failings, despite all its uh, difficulties that we encounter. Uh, let me answer uh, Jim's question. Uh, when Vice President Biden visited Japan uh, last December, uh, you know, both governments agreed to, you know, you know establish the senior level uh, development dialogue. And in fact, I noticed that this morning uh, in the Japanese government, probably in the U.S. government as well, announced that next week we will have the uh, first such meeting. So even though we have continued uh, our dialogue and discussion uh, with our counterparts of USAID for like a global health, like a food security, and many other issues. But probably, uh, as someone pointed out, you know, um, based upon the recent development, some issues, uh, not necessarily new, but issues like gender, women, uh, which uh, Prime Minister Abe announced in the last uh, General Assembly meeting might be uh, one of the uh, issues to be discussed. Thank you. Excellent. Well, that's a very good transition into the next panel because uh, we'll be talking about, I hope that both um, Araki-san and uh, Denise Rollins will address and give us a little bit of a taste of what's going to be in that new dialogue and, and some of the opportunities for partnership going forward. Um, I, I um, did steal a couple of your minutes uh, from your coffee break, so I'll give you back two of them. Uh, I'd like everybody back uh, by 11.02. Uh, there is coffee up there on the uh, terrace. Please join me in thanking our panelists for that excellent set of presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much.